Good morning, and welcome to the 2016 Department of Justice Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Pride Month Observance, Observance Program. My name is John Elias. I am counsel and chief of staff to the acting associate attorney general and president of DOJ Pride. It is my privilege to welcome our distinguished speakers, component heads, and all of you here in the Great Hall and watching on the Justice Television Network and at usdoj.gov. To begin, I ask that you please rise for the singing of the national anthem by Rick Knight of the Gay Men's Chorus of Washington, D.C. dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there <clears throat> oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knight. At this time, I would like to formally welcome our distinguished speakers. First, it is my great honor to welcome the Attorney General of the United States, the Honorable Loretta E. Lynch. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our keynote speaker, Shannon Price Minter, Legal Director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. <laughs> Mr. Minter, welcome to the Department of Justice. We are grateful that you could join us for today's events and also for your decades of work on behalf of the LGBT community. And I would like to acknowledge Granette Trent, Assistant Director for Affirmative Employment, JMD EEO staff, who will provide the program's closing remarks. Thank you, Granette, and the rest of the EEO staff for the sponsorship of today's program and the strong partnership with DOJ Pride that we have had for over the course of many years. Thank you. I am also joined on stage by Barbara Schwabauer, Senior Trial Attorney from the Civil Rights Division and Vice President of DOJ Pride, who will present the DOJ Pride Awards. Thank you as well. <laughs> Finally, I would like to acknowledge the Board of Directors of DOJ Pride, who contributed not only to the efforts behind today's program, but all year to make the department a more inclusive and welcoming place. Board members, please stand and be recognized. During the month of June, our nation and the department traditionally celebrate the contributions of LGBT Americans and their allies and reaffirm our collective commitment to ensuring that all Americans have equal opportunities to achieve their personal and professional aspirations. I re was reminded on how far we've come on a recent trip I took to England. So the story there is from England, but I think there's some real analogs to what 
what we've experienced and, and the change that has happened here. While on my trip, I visited Bletchley Park. There, during the Second World War, Allied code breakers successfully deciphered Nazi communications. The leader of that project, Alan Turing, was a gay man. You may recall his story being told in the movie The Imitation Game. A pioneer of computing, his work at Bletchley Park saved countless lives. But after the war, Turing was committed was convicted of gross indecency simply for acknowledging having had a sexual relationship with another man. That trumped all the good works that he had done, just his mere fact, the mere fact of his homosexuality. He received a horrible punishment, lost his security clearance, and his death not long afterwards was ruled a suicide. In 2013, Turing received a small measure of vindication with a posthumous pardon. Others convicted of similar crimes, however, did not. Turing's story, which is emblematic of experience that people faced at the time here in the US as well, unfortunately, is a reminder that what has been done cannot be undone, but we can do right in the present. And advocates, including attorneys like those here today, have played a key role in bringing about a more just society. But Turing's story also highlights that justice cannot be only for the geniuses or the powerful or the famous. It is for everyone, including the historically marginalized or vulnerable. Here at the department, A.G. Lynch, in announcing the challenge to North Carolina's House Bill 2, the so-called bathroom law, gave voice to the need to protect all Americans. She said, this country was founded on a promise of equal rights for all, and we have always managed to move closer to that promise little by little. The theme for today's program, The Struggle for Equality Continues, echoes that sentiment. We recognize the gains while acknowledging the work that remains to be done. Attorney General Lynch, I cannot tell you how proud I was on the day that we filed this, uh, that the department filed a challenge to House Bill 2, how proud I was to be affiliated with the Department of Justice. That action not only was so powerful on its own merits, but it clearly resonated. At the end of the day, I logged onto social media, like a lot of us do at the end of the day, and I expected to see the usual pictures of people's dinner or um, stories about how messed up their commute was, which we know is an increasingly common occurrence here. But instead, I saw something really moving, which was photo after photo after photo, and since it's 2016, also video clip after video clip of uh, you and the press conference uh, that you gave and, and your remarks, and um, it, it, it clearly moved so many people very deeply, um, and it, it, was a really, it was a really powerful day. And although the department's actions were well received within my social network, we know that it was a courageous step uh, in this very large uh, and varied country. Um, Attorney General Lynch has been a true champion for the LGBT community, and we are grateful to have her here today. She's demonstrated through words and actions her strong commitment to equal opportunity for all and her willingness to advocate for positive change, even in the face of opposition or controversy, is an inspiration. Ladies and gentlemen, please give me a, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Loretta E. Lynch, Attorney General of the United States. Thank you everyone for that warm welcome. Thank you so much, John, for that, that kind introduction, uh, for those words. But thank you so much for your dedication, not just to the Office of the Associate Attorney General, but to the principals of this department. The pride I feel in you every day grows and grows when I see the work that you are doing on behalf of the American people. Uh, let me also thank Richard Toscano and his colleagues from the Equal Employment Opportunity Staff, as well as DOJ Pride's entire leadership. I was so happy to see the board here, but of course they're members of the organization and has roots deep 
and it goes throughout the department. So thank you all for putting together this outstanding program today. And of course, we have two outstanding award recipients today. And I have to tell you, my pride in them is just boundless for the work that they do on behalf of the American people every day in different venues, but touching lives, saving lives, and in fact, saving families. Ashley Evans and Shannon Price Minter are with us today, and you honor us with your presence. And so let me thank all of you as well who've come together, the attorneys, the advocates, also the friends and family members of our award recipients and our board members for being here today. I am truly, truly honored to be with you today to celebrate Pride Month. We're here in the great hall of the Department of Justice, a beautiful room as you can see, and it's where we come to basically commemorate the special moments in the Department of Justice. It's where we come to commemorate and honor the contributions of the varied and the diverse voices that make us all strong. It's where we come for our most important events, and that's why we're all here today. And every year during Pride Month, we take a moment to commemorate the accomplishments of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals who have spurred this country on to make strides towards the stronger, the more equal, and the more perfect union that all Americans deserve. We talk about the road that we've taken. We talk about the challenges that we've faced and the obstacles that we've overcome. And we look ahead to the journey that we know still stretches out before us. This year, this is a particularly special moment. We celebrate the final Pride Month of the Obama administration, an administration that has looked at these issues and taken them squarely on. And over the course of these last eight years, a short time in the history of a nation, a blink of an eye in the generations of pain that have defined this issue. But in the course of just eight short years, we have made once unimaginable progress on issues that have challenged our nation for decades and that had been felt for centuries by individual Americans, by real people who often suffered in silence in ways large and small through the policies of this administration and more importantly today through the undertakings of this department, but also most importantly through the actions of all of you here in this room today and across this country. We have bent the arc of the moral universe a little bit further towards justice. Now with the adoption of the landmark Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, signed into law in 2009 by President Obama, we strengthened our ability to achieve justice on behalf of those who were victimized because of race, religion, color, or national origin, but for the first time also, their disability status, their gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation. With the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2010, we made it clear that an individual's ability to fight for the country they love should never be dependent on the person that they love. And with the signing of the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013, we established new protections to ensure that LGBT survivors of domestic violence can access the same services as other survivors of intimate partner abuse. And of course, with the historic Supreme Court decisions in U.S. versus Wender, Obergefell versus Hodges, we achieved watershed victories not only for couples who sought equal marriage rights or even for the LGBT community. These were victories for all Americans. They were victories for all of us who understand the truth of President Obama's words that if we are truly created equal, then surely the love that we commit to one another must be equal as well. And in just the last few weeks, we stood side by side with the transgender community to demand respect, to insist upon dignity, and to ensure that transgender individuals are able to live the lives they were born to lead. Now these are all remarkable steps forward. And how fortunate are we to be able to live and work in this time, right here, right now, how many people are able to actually see and be a part of their country literally moving 
towards a better place. We think that those great moments are often lost to history, but we are here and now. And so, here and now, in this place, let us celebrate these achievements and express our own pride. Pride in this country for drawing closer to the promise of equality and opportunity that was made at its founding more than two centuries ago. Pride in this Department of Justice for being part of an extraordinary movement that has made its way from a bar in Greenwich Village to the steps of the Supreme Court to a White House draped in the rainbow flag. That's a path, that's a journey. But most of all, let us express our pride and our admiration. Let us express our gratitude for all of you here today and in the LGBT community and its millions of allies who have spent decades performing the small acts of courage, who stood up, who came out, who carried on every day in the face of antagonism, in defiance of threats, and in pursuit of the chance to live freely and without fear, because it is your courage that truly inspires our pride. Now, of course, there's no doubt that we still have further to go. And recent events have reminded us that progress does not come easily, and the victories are rarely total or final. But we all know the fight for equality has never been easy, no matter who has carried the banner. And it's up to all of us in the days ahead to stand up against all forms of bigotry, no matter how small, no matter how large, and to press forward in our mission to ensure equal rights and equal justice for every American. Because it is still true that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Now, it won't be easy, but remember this. Remember this, know this, and keep this in your hearts. Because of the work that you have done, this country has been transformed. It has. And as we take these next steps, as we move forward in this fight, we will do so in a country that is formally recognized that love is love, and that extends the right to marry, to gay and lesbian and bisexual couples. And as we move forward in our march, we do so in a nation that legally protects transgender individuals' rights to be their true selves without abuse, without discrimination, and without fear. And as we continue in this journey, we do so in a society that understands more than ever that the LGBT community story is part of the American story a story of struggle and hope, a story of reversal and redemption, and a story of a nation that sometimes, some would say often, falls short of its ideals but is always determined to overcome. And the fact that we've arrived at this point and that we are entering this new era is in large part thanks to your outstanding work. In the days ahead, this country, this movement, this department will continue to rely on all of you we rely on your engagement, we rely on your leadership, we rely on your strength, we rely on your courage, the brilliant attorneys, the hardworking advocates who've worked with us so far as we seek to build on this momentum and expand on our success. We rely on courageous public servants like Ashley Evans as we seek to broaden our approach and foster inclusions. And we will rely on passionate leaders like the man that I am so pleased to be able to introduce to you now a true leader in the LGBT movement, a champion in the cause of civil rights. Shannon Price Mentor serves as the legal director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, one of America's foremost advocacy organizations for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Shannon has spent his professional career speaking out for all those who face discrimination because of who they are and whom they love. He has received numerous awards for his important and trailblazing work. And last year, he was appointed to serve as a member of President Obama's Commission on White House Fellowships. Now, Shannon has made his name advocating the large policy issues that affect so many of our communities. But he has also worked on cases dealing with individuals and their right to have a family and have the family built in the American dream. Because, of course, the ability to, to love and to create that family is at the heart of community, is at the heart of our country. And in doing so, 
He is upholding the highest ideals of this republic. It is truly an honor to have him address us here today. Please join me in welcoming Shannon Price Mentor to the Department of Justice. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I am beyond thrilled to be here. You know, this is simply wonderful, and it's uh, the honor of a lifetime, and it's certainly the honor of my lifetime to be here today with Attorney General Lynch and, and with all of you. You know, you all are such heroes to our community, to our whole country, and I'm so delighted to have a chance to say that to you directly. Believe me, I, you could never fully appreciate what it has meant in the lives and hearts of LGBT people and their families, their children, their parents, their grandparents across this country to have the United States Department of Justice and the Attorney General of the United States standing with us, and supporting our right to be treated as full, equal, respected, participating, contributing members of this society. That has meant the world, it's changed lives, and it has saved lives. And it has been a powerful testament to the resilience of our, and the continued importance of our Constitution. You know, as a transgender person, I am grateful every day for the changes that have been made under this administration and that changed my life directly in ways I never could have imagined. And, you know, not just when I was growing up as a child in Texas, but even more recently, when some of the progress we've made, which Attorney General Lynch was alluding to, the past eight years has been so extraordinary. I mean, thanks, and a lot of it's been thanks in great part to your leadership. But for example, you know, I, I married my wife Robin, who's here with me today in California in 2001. But even though we were legally able to marry in California because the state of California recognized my gender as a transgender man, it was not at all clear that the federal government or other states would recognize our marriage. We'd become accustomed to living in a kind of limbo and not knowing whether or when our marriage might be challenged and worrying a lot that if something were to happen to me, it was by no means certain that Robin or our daughter Alia would be recognized or protected. And then in the Windsor litigation, the department took the principled and courageous step of recognizing and arguing so eloquently in the U.S. Supreme Court that DOMA violated the U.S. Constitution. And then, of course, last year, the Solicitor General again stood up in Obergefell and once again made the case for equality with such great conviction and force and in words that clearly resonated in the court's final decision. The administration, this department, have protected transgender people and stood up for our equality in so many other ways, you know, from making it possible to get a passports uh, that match our gender, to travel without being harassed by TSA agents simply because our bodies may not be what they're expecting, to obtain equal health care, to access homeless shelters, domestic violence services, and so much more. But just as important, I mean, maybe more important than any of those particular uh, advances or protections has been the extraordinary experience, which extends not just to transgender people, but to the entire LGBT community and a lot of other communities as well, but being treated with genuine care and concern, being embraced by the president, by the Department of Justice, by every part of this administration with such genuine respect. I mean, you all have set an example at the very highest level of our government, and you have changed the way that people see us and the way that people treat us. And as an attorney, you know, it's been so powerful and inspiring to see the integrity and the scrupulous care with which you all have honored your constitutional obligation of representing the citizens of this country, all of its citizens, and of enforcing the law in the public interest. We know that like throughout our history, courts and governments often 
have ignored the principle of equality and the principle that laws should be applied equally and fairly to all people, you know, simply just by excluding disfavored groups from statutory and constitutional protections and then coming up with post hoc justifications for those exclusions. We've seen that most egregiously with people of color. We've seen it with women, with immigrants, Native Americans, people with disabilities. And we've seen it too with LGBT people. And I'm thinking here particularly of older decisions holding that laws such as Title VII and Title IX that prohibit sex discrimination somehow just don't protect LGBT people and that we're somehow outside of the fold even though the very essence of what it means to be gay or transgender is, is based on sex. But we've also, through our history, seen advocates and communities question those exclusions. And we've seen courts eventually come around and first acknowledge and then slowly you know, correct those exclusions. And it is just thrilling to be living at a time when courts are finally recognizing and correcting the unprincipled exclusion of LGBT people from sex discrimination laws. And it is deeply gratifying to see the federal government, from the EOC to the Department of Education, Department of Justice, leading the way on this and recognizing that harassment of an LGBT person at work or an LGBT student at school is sex-based harassment, or that the denial of benefits because a person is in a same-sex relationship is sex-based discrimination. And yes, recognizing that barring a transgender worker or a student from restrooms, that is also sex-based discrimination. And your leadership on these issues, and these are some of the most important legal issues of our time, has been transformative. Really, for the very first time, transgender people across the country have the security of knowing that their most basic rights to work, to be a student, are being safeguarded by the federal government. And when states like North Carolina enact laws that single them out for discrimination, the federal government will step in and protect them. You know, speaking of North Carolina, uh, well, I mean, we know that when so much progress is being made, of course there will be some resistance, some ugliness, and some will try, often very cynically, to exploit fears and misconceptions. And it's just so easy to engender fear and mistrust of people who are different or who seem different. And it's so rare, unfortunately, for public officials to have the moral and intellectual courage and clarity to address those fears and calm them. But Attorney General Lynch, the remarks that she made in North Carolina when the department filed its historic challenge to HB2 will, I am sure, long be remembered as one of the most astute, powerful, sobering reflections on anti-LGBT bias in the history of our movement. The attacks on transgender people that we're seeing in so many parts of the country right now, and particularly the degrading focus on bathrooms, have been so shaming and so dispiriting, and frankly at times even so disorienting, just in the relentless belittling of our lives in the crudest possible terms. I know I'm not the only transgender person who listened to Attorney General Lynch's words that day and I literally felt my head lift and my back straighten, my spirit restore and my sense of dignity as a human being return. And as she perfectly put it that day, you know, this issue is about a great deal more than just bathrooms. This is about the dignity and respect we accord our fellow citizens. But we needed, and our country needed, to hear those words. And we owe her an enormous debt of gratitude for reorienting us in the struggle and really helping us climb back up on that higher ground and remember, as she put it, the values of inclusion, diversity, and regard for all that make our country great. And we know, you know the challenges particularly facing LGBT young people in this country are still very real. And especially now that we've achieved so much, you know, marriage equality and so much more, we all have a huge responsibility to those young people who are still living in so much peril, in particular to their families and communities to help them understand how to support those young people. Now, I was so grateful for the president's response to the death of Leela Alcorn 
the young transgender girl who died by suicide last year at the age of 17 after she had been sent to conversion therapy. And, you know, the president didn't have to say anything about her death, but he did. And his comments were so sensitive and compassionate, I mean, both to Leela and her family. And they reflected, you know, what to me, I think, has just been the principle that's most defined uh, this administration. And that's a belief that we can actually come together and work together to make change and to make our country better and more welcoming to more people. But after Leela's death, HHS undertook remarkable, unprecedented efforts to review all the scientific literature on conversion therapy and issued a report which is written by some of the leading experts in that field warning parents about the dangers of conversion therapy and providing them with information about safe you know, evidence-based ways to understand and support their LGBT children. You know this is an issue that is particularly uh, close to me. You know as a teenager I was terrified that my parents would send me away for a conversion Therapy. I knew there were places doing that all around where we lived in Texas, and I prayed every day that would not happen. And then when I was a new attorney, the very first case I ever had was representing a young woman who had been sent from California to Utah for conversion therapy. And it was that case that actually inspired me to uh, go to NCLR and start a legal program to help young people who'd been through those kind of experiences. But this is still one of our most pressing issues. And, just a couple of years ago, we started a, a new campaign called Born Perfect with the goal of ending conversion therapy in this country in five years. We've now passed um, laws prohibiting the use of conversion therapy on minors in six states and D.C. And we also have a complaint in front of the Federal Trade Commission right now alleging that the practice of conversion therapy, taking people's money for something that's so fraudulent, is, is a type of consumer fraud. And some of you may be thinking, oh, you know, I think this, this surely is a thing of the past, but it is, it is not. You know, in fact, the conversion therapy industry has really ramped up its efforts in the past 15 years, really targeting young people now and targeting vulnerable parents. We're working right now on a case, it's a terrible case in my home state of Texas. We're trying to help a 17-year-old lesbian teenager straight-A student whose parents have put her into an extremely isolated so-called treatment center. And this place has cut off all contact uh, with the outside world and is trying to change her identity. And we've had some initial success with the court because of that HHS report. You know, and the truth is that these stories are still happening every day. And it's these young people and these families who are so vulnerable and are most harmed by the lies propagated by HB2 and, and similar laws, and they're also the ones who stand to benefit the most when those lies are exposed. So as the Attorney General has said, you know, our strength as a people has always been to turn great challenges into great opportunities. I really think we have such an opportunity now with this unprecedented visibility and focus on transgender people, even though right now it's pretty scary and painful. But I do, I did want to just share a quick story about that. You know, I've been working with the mom of a transgender girl in Tennessee. This mom was trying really hard to understand her daughter, but she was really struggling and having a hard time accepting her. I'll never forget the day this mom reached out to me after President Obama had congratulated Caitlyn Jenner on coming out as transgender. And the mom asked me, she said, did you see that the president called Caitlyn Jenner a hero? Wow, the president thinks my child is a hero. I was so moved and I realized that the president's remarks surely were having a similar effect on millions of, of other parents. And I just wanna conclude here today by telling you the same thing is true of the work that you all are doing in North Carolina and beyond. Every time you stand up for our founding ideals, you are sending a powerful message of hope to young people and adults who really need to hear it. You know, as Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than to fix broken adults. But you all are doing both of those things. And let me close by saying again, thank you for this wonderful opportunity, for the chance to be here with you all today, and for all that you're doing to safeguard and vindicate 
our nation's most pre precious heritage. That is our commitment to equality, however imperfect and flawed it and we may be. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Minter, and thank you, Attorney General Lynch, for these remarks. Let's give them both uh, one more round of applause, so thank you. <laughs> to express the department's gratitude for his remarks and participation in today's program, we now present Mr. Minter with a small token of appreciation. At this time, Barbara Schwabauer, Senior Trial Attorney from the Civil Rights Division and Vice President of DOJ Pride will present the DOJ Pride Awards. It is my great honor to present our annual DOJ Pride Awards this morning. This year's awardees are two exceptionally dedicated individuals whom we are grateful to have by our side as the struggle for LGBT equality continues. The Gerald B. Romer Community Service Award recognizes contributions to the LGBT community. The award celebrates the life of Jerry Romer, who died in 1997. After receiving his HIV diagnosis, Jerry completed law school and began a career at the Department of Justice. After his passing, former Attorney General Janet Reno noted that he humanized the experience of living with AIDS, demonstrating courage and hope to all. The winner of this year's Romer Award is Shannon Price Minter. His nomination for this award echoes the praise that we have heard from others on this stage today. Under his leadership, the National Center for Lesbian Rights has fought successfully against school bullying, for access to public benefits for transgender men and women, and for the right to marriage equality for same-sex couples. His efforts include, among countless others, securing a Supreme Court decision upholding student group policies prohibiting discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation, as well as representing same-sex couples from Tennessee in the Supreme Court's 2015 decision affirming the right of same-sex couples to marry. All via winner of this year's Trailer B. Romer Award, Shannon Price Minter. The James R. Douglas Award recognizes contributions to the work-life environment of the department's LGBT employees. This award is named in honor of Jim Douglas, who was an openly gay, HIV-positive employee of the Department of Justice who died in 1996. He was also a founding member of DOJ Pride. The winner of this year's Douglas Award is Ashley Evans. Ashley Evans is an intelligence analyst in the Washington field office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and she serves as the chairperson of FBI Pride. Ashley has significantly contributed to the mission of the FBI by encouraging LGBT employees to step forward, serve openly, and participate fully. In 2012, Ashley led the small group of employees who founded the FBI Pride. FBI Pride has accomplished much in its brief existence acting as a strong and effective advocate for FBI's LGBT employees, enrolling hundreds of members, putting on numerous events, and conducting a membership survey that generated useful and surprising results. Ashley's countless hours of dedication have increased visibility and awareness of LGBT issues within the FBI and have helped to create a more accepting culture for its LGBT employees. Please welcome to the stage the winner of this year's James R. Douglas Award, Ashley Evans.
We now welcome Granette Trent, Assistant Director for Affirmative Employment, JMD EEO staff, to provide the program's closing remarks. Thank you, John, and good morning to all. Many thanks again to our distinguished speakers, Attorney General Lynch and Shannon Price Minter, for their special remarks this morning and for joining us today. In addition, I would like to thank John Elias and DOJ Pride for partnering with the JMD EEO staff to coordinate this important program. The DOJ LGBT Month Observers Program was coordinated under the auspices of the DOJ LGBT Special Emphasis Program. As this program continues to grow, the DOJ EEO community will partner with the department's internal and external EEO stakeholders to develop and implement activities that will support employment of LGBT individuals here at the department. All DOJ employees are invited to attend the various special observance programs and other affirmative employment activities that our office sponsors throughout the year. Affirmative employment programs and activities are, play a critical role in helping us to maintain an equal employment opportunity in our workplace, inclusion, and foster a diverse work environment. Before you leave today, there is a, I'd like you to take a moment and complete the evaluation that's on your chair. This is very important. Your feedback is very important to us. We want to know what kinds of activities, events, programs, things that you'd like to see out of our, out of our office. We'd like to know your thoughts about this program. Um, we really take your feedback very seriously. We want to make sure that we're providing employees with some of the things that they believe they need that will continue to foster some of the goals that I mentioned earlier. Please leave your completed evaluation form on your chair, or you can leave it on the back table at the entrance to the Great Hall. Thank you for joining us today. This concludes our program. Have a wonderful afternoon.